The Law of Love and How to Show It by Florence Scovelshin. Cover design by Henderson Daniel. Layout by Seraphine Daniel. Email five great books at gmail.com. Design copyright 2011 by Global International LTD. Narrated by Mary Muse. The, the Law, Law of, of Love, Love and How, and to, how show to Show It by Florence Scovelshin. About the author. Florence Scovelshin, born September 24, 1871 in Camden, New Jersey, and died October 17, 1940. She was an American artist and book illustrator who became a New Thought spiritual teacher, metaphysical writer, and one of the first motivational writers of her time. She was educated in Philadelphia, where she attended the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and there she met her future husband, the artist Everett Shin, 1876 to 1953. After getting married, they moved into a studio apartment at Waverly Place near Washington Square, New York. Everett built a theater next door and wrote three plays in which Florence played a leading role. Everett Shin became known as a member of the Ashen School of Art and Florence worked as an illustrator. They got divorced in 1912. Her metaphysical work began with her self-published book, The Game of Life and How to Play It, in 1925. Your Word is Your Wand was published in 1928 and The Secret Door to Success in 1940. The Game of Life and How to Play It is one of her most influential books and includes quotes from the Bible, and anecdotal explanations of the author's understanding of God and man. Her philosophy centers on the power of positive thought and usually includes instructions for verbal or physical affirmations. Shin expressed her philosophy as, The invisible forces are ever working for man, who is always pulling the strings himself, though he does not know it. Owing to the vibratory power of words, whatever man voices, he begins to attract. The Law of Love Every man on this planet is taking his initiation in love. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Alspensky states in Terbium Organum that love is a cosmic phenomenon and opens to man the fourth dimensional world, the world of the wondrous. Real love is selfless and free from fear. It pours itself out upon the object of its affection without demanding any return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure, unselfish love draws to itself its own. It does not need to seek or demand. Scarcely anyone has the faintest conception of real love. Man is selfish, tyrannical, or fearful in his affections, thereby losing the thing he loves. Jealousy is the worst enemy of love, for the imagination runs riot. Seeing the loved one attracted to another, and invariably, these fears objectify if they are not neutralized. For example, a woman came to me in deep distress. The man she loved had left her for other women and said he never intended to marry her. She was torn with jealousy and resentment and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer and added, how could he leave me when I loved him 
so much. I replied, you are not loving that man. You are hating him and added, you can never receive what you have never given. Give a perfect love and you will receive a perfect love. Perfect yourself on this man. Give him a perfect, unselfish love, demanding nothing in return. Do not criticize or condemn and bless him wherever he is. She replied, no, I won't bless him unless I know where he is, she said. Well, I said, that is not real love. When you send out real love, real love will return to you, either from this man or his equivalent. For if this man is not the divine selection, you will not want him. As you are one with God, you are one with the love which belongs to you by divine right. Several months passed, and matters remained about the same, but she was working conscientiously with herself. I said, when you are no longer disturbed by his cruelty, he will cease to be cruel as you are attracting it through your own emotions. Then I told her of a brotherhood in India who never said good morning to each other. They used these words, I salute the divinity in you. They saluted the divinity in every man and in the wild animals in the jungle, and they were never harmed, for they saw only God in every living thing. I said, salute the divinity in this man and say, I see your divine self only. I see you as God see you, perfect, made in his image and likeness. She found she was becoming more poised and gradually losing her resentment. He was a captain, and she always called him the cap. One day, she said suddenly, God bless the cap wherever he is. I replied, now that is real love. And when you have become a complete circle and are no longer disturbed by the situation, you will have his love or attract its equivalent. I was moving at this time and did not have a telephone, so I was out of touch with her for a few weeks when one morning I received a letter saying, we are married. At the earliest opportunity, I paid her a call. My first words were, what happened? Oh, she exclaimed, a miracle. One day I woke up and all suffering had ceased. I saw him that evening and he asked me to marry him. We were married in about a week and I have never seen a more devoted man. There is an old saying, no man is your enemy. No man is your friend and every man is your teacher. So one should become impersonal and learn what each man has to teach him, and soon he would learn his lessons and be free. The woman's lover was teaching her selfless love, which every man, sooner or later, must learn. Suffering is not necessary for man's development. It is the result of the violation of spiritual law, but few people seem able to ruse themselves from their soul sleep without it. When people are happy, they usually become selfish, and automatically the law of karma is set in action. Man often suffers loss through lack of appreciation. I knew a woman who had a very nice husband, but she said often, I don't care anything about being married, but that is nothing against my husband. I'm simply not interested in married life. She had other interests and scarcely remembered she had a husband. She only thought of him when she saw him. One day, her husband told her he was in love with another woman and left. She came to me in distress and resentment. I replied, it is exactly what you spoke the word for. You said you didn't care anything about being married, so the subconscious worked to get you unmarried. She said, oh, yes, I see. People get what they want 
and then feel very much heard. She soon became in perfect harmony with the situation and knew they were both much happier apart. When a woman becomes indifferent or critical and ceases to be an inspiration to her husband, he misses the stimulus of their early relationship and is restless and unhappy. A man came to me dejected, miserable, and poor. His wife was interested in the science of numbers and had had him read. It seems the report was not favorable, for he said, My wife says I'll never amount to anything because I am a two. I replied, I don't care what your number is. You are a perfect idea in divine mind, and we will demand the success and prosperity which are already planned for you by that infinite intelligence. Within a few weeks, he had a very fine position, and a year or two later, he achieved a brilliant success as a writer. No man is a success in business unless he loves his work. The picture the artist paints for love of his art is his greatest work. The pot boiler is always something to live down. No man can attract money if he despises it. Many people are kept in poverty by saying, Money means nothing to me, and I have a contempt for people who have it. This is the reason so many artists are poor. Their contempt for money separates them from it. I remember hearing one artist say of another, He's no good as an artist. He has money in the bank. This attitude of mind, of course, separates a man from his supply. He must be in harmony with a thing in order to attract it. Money is God in manifestation as freedom from want and limitation, but it must be always kept in circulation and put to right uses. Hoarding and saving react with grim vengeance. This does not mean that man should not have houses and lots, stocks and bonds, for the barns of the righteous man shall be full. It means man should not hoard even the principle if an occasion arises when money is necessary. In letting it go out fearlessly and cheerfully, he opens the way for more to come in. For God is man's unfailing and inexhaustible supply. This is the spiritual attitude towards money. And the great bank of the universal never fails. We see an example of hoarding in the film production of Greed. The woman won $5,000 in a lottery, but would not spend it. She hoarded and saved, let her husband suffer and starve, and eventually she scrubbed floors for a living. She loved the money itself and put it above everything, and one night, she was murdered and the money taken from her. This is an example of where love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is good and beneficial, but used for destructive purposes, hoarded and saved, or considered more important than love, brings disease and disaster and the loss of money itself. Follow the path of love and all things are added. For God is love, and God is supply. Follow the path of selfishness and greed, and the supply vanishes, or man is separated from it. For example, I knew the case of a very rich woman who hoarded her income. She rarely gave anything away, but bought and bought things for herself. She was very fond of necklaces, and a friend once asked her how many she possessed. She replied, 67. She bought them and put them away, carefully wrapped in tissue paper. Had she used the necklaces, it would have been quite legitimate, but she was violating the law of use. Her closets were filled with clothes she never wore and jewels which never saw the light. 
The woman's arms were gradually becoming paralyzed from holding on to things. And eventually, she was considered incapable of looking after her affairs, and her wealth was handed over to others to manage. So man, in ignorance of the law, brings about his own destruction. All disease, all unhappiness, come from the violation of the law of love. Man's boomerangs of hate, resentment, and criticism come back laden with sickness and sorrow. Love seems almost a lost art, but the man with the knowledge of spiritual law knows it must be regained, for without it, he has become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. For example, I had a student who came to me month after month to clean her consciousness of resentment. After a while, she arrived at the point where she resented only one woman, but that one woman kept her busy. Little by little, she became poised and harmonious, and one day, all resentment was wiped out. She came in radiant and exclaimed, You can't understand how I feel. The woman said something to me, and instead of being furious, I was loving and kind, and she apologized and was perfectly lovely to me. No one can understand the marvelous lightness I feel within. Love and goodwill are invaluable in business. For example, a woman came to me complaining of her employer. She said she was cold and critical and knew she did not want her in the position. Well, I replied, Salute the divinity in the woman and send her love. She said, I can't. She's a marble woman. I answered, you remember the story of the sculptor who asked for a certain piece of marble? He was asked why he wanted it. And he replied, because there is an angel in the marble. And out of it, he produced a wonderful work of art. She said, very well, I'll try it. A week later, she came back and said, I did what you told me to, and now the woman is very kind and took me out in her car. People are sometimes filled with remorse for having done someone unkindness, perhaps years ago. If the wrong cannot be righted, its effect can be neutralized by doing someone a kindness in the present. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto things which are before. Sorrow, regret, and remorse tear down the cells of the body and poison the atmosphere of the individual. A woman said to me, deep in sorrow, Treat me to be happy and joyous, for my sorrow makes me so irritable with members of my family that I keep making more karma. I was asked to treat a woman who was mourning for her daughter. I denied all belief in loss and separation and affirmed that God was the woman's joy, love, and peace. The woman gained her poise at once, but sent word by her son not to treat any longer because she was so happy it wasn't respectable. So, mortal mind loves to hang on to its griefs and regrets. I knew a woman who went about bragging of her troubles, so, of course, she always had something to brag about. The old idea was if a woman did not worry about her children, she was not a good mother. Now, we know that mother fear is responsible for many of the diseases and accidents which come into the lives of children. For fear pictures, vividly the disease or situation feared, and these pictures objectify if not neutralized. Happy is the mother who can say sincerely that she puts her child in God's hands and knows, therefore, that he is divinely protected. For example, a woman awoke suddenly in the night, feeling her brother was in great danger, 
Instead of giving in to her fears, she commenced making statements of truth, saying, Man is a perfect idea and divine mind and is always in his right place. Therefore, my brother is in his right place and is divinely protected. The next day, she found that her brother had been in close proximity to an explosion in a mine, but had miraculously escaped. So man is his brother's keeper in thought, and every man should know that the thing he loves dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the shadow of the Almighty. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Perfect love casteth out fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, and love is the fulfilling of the law. The Law of Love and How to Show It by Florence Scovelshin Intuition or Guidance there is nothing too great of accomplishment for the man who knows the power of his word and who follows his intuitive leads. By the word, he starts in action unseen forces and can rebuild his body or remold his affairs. It is therefore of the utmost importance to choose the right words. And the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. He knows that God is his supply, that there is a supply for every demand, and that his spoken word releases this supply. Ask, and ye shall receive. Man must make the first move. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I have often been asked just how to make a demonstration. I reply, speak the word, and then do not do anything until you get a definite lead. Demand the lead, saying, Infinite Spirit, reveal to me the way. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. The answer will come through intuition or hunch, a chance remark from someone or a passage in a book, etc., etc. The answers are sometimes quite startling in their exactness. For example, a woman desired a large sum of money. She spoke the words, infinite spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right now reach me in great avalanches of abundance. Then she added, give me a definite lead. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. The thought came quickly. Give a certain friend who had helped her spiritually a hundred dollars. She told her friend who said, wait and get another lead before giving it. So she waited, and that day met a woman who said to her, I gave someone a dollar today. It was just as much for me as it would be for you to give someone a hundred. This was indeed an unmistakable lead. So she knew she was right in giving the hundred dollars. It was a gift which proved a great investment. For shortly after that, a large sum of money came to her in a remarkable way. Giving opens the way for receiving. In order to create activity in finances, one should give. Tithing or giving one-tenth of one's income is an old Jewish custom and is sure to bring increase. Many of the richest men in this country have been tithers, and I have never known it to fail as an investment. The tenth part goes forth and returns blessed and multiplied, but the gift or the tithe must be given with love and cheerfulness, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 
bills should be paid cheerfully. All money should be sent forth fearlessly and with a blessing. This attitude of mind makes man master of money. It is his to obey, and his spoken word then opens vast reservoirs of wealth. Man himself limits his supply by his limited vision. Sometimes the student has a great realization of wealth, but is afraid to act. The vision and action must go hand in hand. A woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a position. So I demanded, infinite spirit, open the way for the woman's right position. Never ask for just a position, ask for the right position, the place already planned in divine mind as it is the only one that will give satisfaction. I then gave thanks that she had already received and that it would manifest quickly. Very soon, she had three positions offered her, two in New York and one in Palm Beach, and she did not know which to choose. I said, ask for a definite lead. The time was almost up and was still undecided when one day she telephoned. When I woke up this morning, I could smell Palm Beach. She had been there before and knew its balmy fragrance. I replied, well, if you can smell Palm Beach from here, it is certainly your lead. She accepted the position and it proved a great success. Often, one's lead comes at an unexpected time. One day, I was walking down the street when suddenly felt a strong urge to go to a certain bakery a block or two away. The reasoning mind resisted, arguing, there is nothing there that you want. However, I had learned not to reason, so I went to the bakery, looked at everything, and there was certainly nothing there that I wanted, but coming out, I encountered a woman I had thought of often and who was in great need of the help which I could give her. So often, one goes for one thing and finds another. Intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain, but simply points the way. A person often receives a lead during a treatment. The idea that comes may seem quite irrelevant, but some of God's leadings are mysterious. In the class one day, I was treating that each individual would receive a definite lead. A woman came to me afterwards and said, while you were treating, I got the hunch to take my furniture out of storage and get an apartment. The woman had come to be treated for health. I told her I knew in getting a home of her own, her health would improve. And I added, I believe your trouble, which is a congestion, has come from having things stored away. Congestion of things causes congestion in the body. You have violated the law of use, and your body is paying the penalty. So I gave thanks that divine order was established in her mind, body, and affairs. People's little dream of their affairs react on the body. There is a mental correspondence for every disease. A person might receive instantaneous healing through the realization of his body being a perfect idea in divine mind and therefore whole and perfect. But if he continues his destructive thinking, hoarding, hating, fearing, condemning, the disease will return. Jesus Christ knew that all sickness came from sin but admonished the leper after the healing to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon him. So man's soul or subconscious mind must be washed whiter than snow for permanent healing. And a metaphysician is always delving deep for the correspondence. Jesus Christ said, condemn not, lest ye also be condemned. Judge not lest ye be judged. Many people 
have attracted disease and unhappiness through condemnation of others. What man condemns in others, he attracts to himself. For example, a friend came to me in anger and distress because her husband had deserted her for another woman. She condemned the other woman and said continually she knew he was a married man and had no right to accept his attentions. I replied, stop condemning the woman, bless her, and be through with the situation. Otherwise, you are attracting the same thing to yourself. She was deaf to my words and a year or two later became deeply interested in a married man herself. Man picks up a live wire whenever he criticizes or condemns and may expect a shock. Indecision is a stumbling block in many a pathway. In order to overcome it, make the statement repeatedly. I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. These words impress the subconscious, and soon one finds himself awake and alert, making his right moves without hesitation. I have found it destructive to look to the psychic plane for guidance, as it is the plane of many minds and not the the one mind. As man opens his mind to subjectivity, he becomes a target for destructive forces. The psychic plane is the result of man's mortal thought and is on the plane of opposites. He may receive either good or bad messages. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man down on the mental or mortal plane, for they deal only with the karmic path. I know of a man who should have been dead years ago, according to his horoscope. But he is alive and a leader of one of the biggest movements in this country for the uplift of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, every false prophecy shall come to naught. Every plan my Father in heaven has not planned shall be dissolved and dissipated. The divine idea now comes to pass. However, if any good message has ever been given of coming happiness or wealth, harbor and expect it, and it will manifest sooner or later through the law of expectancy. Man's will should be used to back the universal will. I will that the will of God be done. It is God's will to give every man every righteous desire of his heart. And man's will should be used to hold the perfect vision without wavering. The prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. It is indeed often an effort of the will to leave the husk and swine of mortal thinking. It is so much easier for the average person to have fear than faith. So faith is an effort of the will. As man becomes spiritually awakened, he recognizes that any external inharmony is the correspondence of mental inharmony. If he stumbles or falls, he may know he is stumbling or falling in consciousness. One day, a student was walking along the street, condemning someone in her thoughts. She was saying mentally, that woman is the most disagreeable woman on earth, when suddenly three Boy Scouts rushed around the corner and almost knocked her over. She did not condemn the Boy Scouts, but immediately called on the law of forgiveness, and saluted the divinity in the woman. Wisdom's way are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. When one has made his demands upon the universal, he must be ready for surprises. Everything may seem to be going wrong when in reality it is going right, 
For example, a woman was told that there was no loss in divine mind. Therefore, she could not lose anything which belonged to her. Anything lost would be returned or she would receive its equivalent. Several years previously, she had lost $2,000. She had loaned the money to a relative during her lifetime, but the relative had died, leaving no mention of it in her will. The woman was resentful and angry, and as she had no written statement of the transaction, she never received the money, so she determined to deny the loss and collect the $2,000 from the Bank of the Universal. She had to begin by forgiving the woman, as resentment and unforgiveness closed the doors of this wonderful bank. She made this statement, I deny loss. There is no loss in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot lose the $2,000, which belonged to me by divine right. As one door shuts, another door opens. She was living in an apartment house, which was for sale. And in the lease was a clause stating that if the house was sold, the tenants would be required to move out within 90 days. Suddenly, the landlord broke the leases and raised the rent. Again, injustice was on her pathway, but this time she was undisturbed. She blessed the landlord and said, As the rent has been raised, it means that I'll be that much richer, for God is my supply. New leases were made out for the advanced rent, but by some divine mistake, the 90 days clause had been forgiven. Soon after, the landlord had an opportunity to sell the house. On account of the mistake in the new leases, the tenants held possession for another year. The agent offered each tenant $200 if he would vacate. Several families moved. Three remained, including the woman. A month or two passed and the agent again appeared. This time, he said to the woman, Will you break your lease for the sum of $1,500? It flashed upon her, Here comes the $2,000. She remembered having said to friends in the house, We will all act together if anything more is said about leaving. So her lead was to consult her friends. These friends said, well, if they have offered you 1500 they will certainly give 2000 So she received a check for $2,000 for giving up the apartment. It was certainly a remarkable working of the law, and the apparent injustice was merely opening the way for her demonstration. It proved that there is no loss. And when man takes his spiritual stand, he collects all that is his from this great reservoir of good. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. These adverse thoughts alone rob man, for no man gives to himself but himself, and no man takes away from himself but himself. Man is here to prove God and to bear witness to the truth, and he can only prove God by bringing plenty out of lack and justice out of injustice. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Affirmations, definite lead, infinite spirit, reveal to me the way. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. For freedom from all bondage, I cast this burden on the Christ within and I go free. For health. Divine love floods my consciousness with health. 
and every cell in my body is filled with light. Thank you for listening to The Law of Love and How to Show It by Florence Scovelshin. It has been my utmost pleasure and honor to narrate this piece. My name is Mary Muse. Blessings.